So please help me welcoming to the stage Alice Walker and Parnesha Jones. Good morning, good afternoon, good brand new day. Um, hello, Ms. Walker. Hi. How are you? I'm really well. Good. Um, <clears throat> I have been working myself up to this in so many different ways, which included writing questions, which when they first asked me if I would be in conversation with you, I, I went through a series of things. Fear. <laughs> Happiness. I actually did a little break dancing. <laughs> and then I had to stop and think, what, what am I going to ask this woman who ha has been so brave to ask so many questions about us? And the only way I could see fit of starting this conversation, because as a poet, I do this all the time with people I, I love from afar, is to write a poem especially for them. So this morning at 5 a.m. <clears throat> Reminder for Alice Walker. I never realized how important those reminders are until they remind you how human you are. We're not so great, but oh, how beautiful we are when we see the human in each other. Oh, that reminder, the color purple. And then I'm reminded that that was my grandmother's favorite color. Mm -hmm. Oh, I swear by the light of my father's smile, a smile I will never know, but I am sure it's still beautiful, though. And then I am reminded that I have my father's smile. Mm -hmm. Those reminders, though, they whisper and pull us back from all the shouting so we can actually see who's shouting and why. And they remind us that the ancestors never sleep. Those reminders, goodness, they know what we're all thinking, even when we don't have the courage just to say it to ourselves. Every beauty beloved, monstrous way we can be, those reminders save us, bring us back to what we all need to be reminded of time and time again, the reminder that reminds us of how human we all really are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> As a reminder, this book, when I started reading it and read it again and went back to reading it again, taking the arrow out of the heart should be the new model for the world, I think. I wanted to start with the question and the idea of why you needed to have this book in your time in life, in your relationship with the world. Why this book right now? Uh, because I think planetarily we have an arrow in the heart. I mean, this is not Cupid's arrow. This mm. is the arrow of absolute awareness that we may well be in the final days or years or decades of our planet. Uh, and also that we uh, connect it now so that we can see all parts pretty much of the world. And we see the suffering uh, and we have to find some way to allow ourselves to deeply, deeply feel the arrow that is going in our hearts because we are aware. You cannot see the things that we now see without having that arrow. I mean, it's just impossible. Unless you don't have a feeling at all, then there are people, of course, who are like that. But hopefully not in this auditorium. <laughs> well, much of your work, including this, um, this collection, <clears throat> goes into depth with the idea of the human in all of us. And I think as time goes on and all the threats that we have, do you feel the idea of human has become diluted? Have we diluted it in what we do with the world, what we do to each other? And is it harder to write when you feel the humans are more diluted, if you feel that way? 
Well, I am very fortunate that I keep finding them. Uh, I find people who are living fully in their humanity. And actually, that means often living not in this country, uh, because sometimes I do despair here. I feel that <clears throat> the greed, uh, the, the need not to be aware is so strong. Uh, that people live as if it's okay to live the way they're living in such, often such separation, you know. And um, yeah, I think, I think we are losing a lot, and yet I feel very encouraged by every little effort that we make, and I see a lot of those efforts being made. I, I so cherish and champion people who, no matter how large the opposition, will still stand up to it. Thank you. Do you feel your audience changes with each book you do? I don't know. I have no way of really knowing. I can only hope that uh, whatever I'm writing will be some comfort, you know, or some encouragement, or some help and awareness. Uh, as I was saying to um, my friend on the way over, um, that some people just refuse to be aware and how tragic it is, and I'll give you the example that I gave to her. Uh, I, I'm publishing my journals uh, soon, next year or so, and I, that meant I had to go back and read them. And I discovered that I had actually queried four quite prominent African-American male writers about Zora Neale Hurston, and I'm sure many of you are aware of her work. I hope so. But anyway, they, they really, to a person, and this was amazing to me, they all said with great, uh, you know, equanimity, I haven't read her. And these were people who, who, who help us, who are supposed to be helping us to understand ourselves. Uh, and it's the same thing you get where you'll give, uh, you know, a man a book that a woman has written, and the man will say, well, I'll give it to my wife. You know, and, and I'm just here to tell you that if that's going to continue, we can't go anywhere. Because it's an ignorance that is deliberately maintained. And it's really deadly, because unless you know what the feminine is thinking, unless you understand what the feminine is feeling, you know, you will never understand what is happening to the planet in a way that makes you help really change it, change what is happening. Well, speaking of different audiences, I mean, one of the things that, if just reading your books over the years and reading your poetry, um, one of the key, many of the key characters in this book are men. Mm -hmm. And the question of how you're writing about men, black men especially, um, which for me, I think, is one of the greatest triumphs in your writing, um, is wanting and willing to write about black men and their relation to black women, their relation to the world. <clears throat> this writing about black men has also produced some of your loudest critics. I want to ask you. But remember, they don't read women writers. That's <laughs> And there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid so, you do. But I want to ask you about these black men, Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali and Jesse Williams and Julian Bond, because some of these poems are odes slash love poems slash like you are imperfect and beautiful and you were really good about telling people about themselves. And <laughs> you speak a certain tenderness to these men that you write about in this mm -hmm. book. And has your writing about black men changed over the years? So if we go back to something um, like your work in The Color Purple up until this point, and that array of writing about black men, do you feel your, it's changed based on you and based off of the commentary that others have said over the years? Well, let me just put it this way. My very first book was a children's book mm -hmm. uh, called To Hell With Dying. And it is about uh, children, and it's really about me and my, well, what happened was, I was at Sarah Lawrence, um, the poorest student there, and I couldn't go home to the funeral of this old guitar player that we all loved. 
And so instead, I wrote this, this story, which Langston Hughes decided was wonderful, and he published it, and then it became a children's book. And it's about, you know, basically, he comes out of not being able to go to his funeral, and I, just the story of what this man meant to my family. So that is, uh, it should be the beginning of people's and men's understanding of my perspective of having lived in a community where not only did I have my parents, you know, my father and my mother, uh, five brothers, you know, innumerable uncles, um, cousins, um, everybody, uh, that actually means that you can write a great deal about many different kinds of behavior and still love everybody because you understand that you're in, you know, totally a part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't start with The Color Purple. That's my third novel. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But I, I just know that that is one that has often come up with in terms of talking about your relationships and how you write about black men. Mm -hmm. You're right, but again, um, I have to say, I really wish our brothers read more. And I really wish they read with depth and compassion and uh, a real ability to see um, that art is, is something that helps us grow. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be pretty at all. Uh, it just has to be useful and it has to, to add something to our understanding of life. But if, if men take up, you know, not just, you know, black men, but men in general, you know, out of this kind of masculine sense that they don't have to know more than they do. But if they have this attitude, <laughs> if they have that attitude, it's impossible then to actually grow. I mean, it really, there's just no way you can do it. So uh, my sorrow about the response to The Color Purple from some black men, not all of them, uh, was just, you know, how can you see something that is so um, obviously devoted to the community, you know? How can you, how can you read it? And in fact, I think there is someone in the audience who was the, one of the few black men who wrote a wonderful review. And Carl Dix, are you here? Yes, I am, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, so, you know, one, one in like, you know, 20 um, men, black men, could actually, you know, encounter this work without feeling threatened and without being abusive then to me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well... Let me ask you, this is something I'm personally curious about, you know, I, my, I'm just going to tell you, my favorite book is by The Light of My Father's Mind. Bless I your read, heart. I read that book and I was like, I'm done, I'm mm -hmm. done. Just sit me down, I don't have to read anything else ever again. Mm -hmm. But then I realized I needed to read more. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask, because obviously, you know, you're known for so many of your works, but The Color Purple is, you know, in a, in a life of its own. I am curious, what, have you ever thought about what if The Color Purple was released right now, in this time, during all this conversation, all this, um, all the movements, all the coming, the reckoning, and everything that we're kind of facing with as, in terms of gender and race and sexuality. Do you ever imagine, like, how people would respond to the color purple if it was released in 2018. I've, but I've seen how they've responded to it, mm -hmm. you know, when it was released. I mean, I think a lot of the, the, the ways that people are today happen because they had an example mm -hmm. of how you can actually live very differently mm -hmm. and that it was a very huge success in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but do you mean just... If it just was first published now, in the same way that it was published then, it's yes. the same story? Yes. I don't know, but you remind me of a woman in, a, in, in one of my you know, talks who, who wanted me to redo The Color Purple. Uh, and I said to her, well, how can I do that? And she said, well, you know, all this police brutality, why don't you bring it up to date? And I said, well, you know, there was 
police brutality back then too, and this it's in the color purple. Yeah, I mean, that is yeah. why Sophia is is in in prison in the mayor's house for all those years. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't really think that way. I mean, okay. I I don't think about going back and uh, or trying to influence. I I really don't. Okay. I, I, I'm I'm enough uh, involved with my own growth, and I think what happens is that I. I express what I feel, and I offer that because you know that's what poets and writers do. And then, if I'm very fortunate, I guess uh, people respond. But in any case, whether they respond or not, you know, I I know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I mean, I really am clear on that, um, and that's a real blessing, mm. you know. And I know there are students here, and you often wonder. You know, what is your meaning? What is your meaning in this life? Mm -hmm. And I advise you to sit with that long enough to really try to get it, to understand. Because we do, I think, now there are some people who are just, I would call them meat people. And that is to say that they, I'm sorry, this is sort of a tangent. No, just go for it. But, I'm ready. Um, but, but meat people seem to have bypassed that stage where they need to have soul connected to expression. And those are the ones, you know, the other term would be psychopath, you know. <laughs> um, so, so they don't have this. But for, for many people, still, um, we're not meat people. We, we still have a soul. And we're still guided by it. But it has to be listened to. It really does. So uh, when I think about what our culture needs more than anything, it's silence. Mm. We, we cannot grow anymore if we continue with the noise that we encounter all the time. Uh, it is harming us deeply. And it's in the quiet that you begin to develop and to understand what it is that you offer what it is that you were here to do. And I feel that we are here to do something, that we all have our work. That's great. Thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I have a question about the technicalities of the writing, because you write in so many different genres. And specifically in, in prose and in poetry, do you enter those differently when you start writing? Do you have a different ritual for them? Well, Is for a novel, my ritual had to be, how can I afford two years when I don't have any money? <laughs> and uh, I, I took all kinds of jobs. I taught when I was sick. Uh, I traveled, flew. I was telling my daughter she was kvetching about having to go to North Dakota. And I said, girl, before you were born, I was over there, as I put it with her, chopping cotton <laughs> in North Dakota. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, you have to, if you are lucky enough to understand what it is you're supposed to be doing, I mean, right there, you're just lucky. OK, I got my assignment. So then it's your job to figure out how you support it. And so, you know, for, for two years, I've written, the longest novel I've written was, um, oh God, the big thick one. Uh, <laughs> the Temple of My Familiar. Actually, I love it, but it's, it was really took a lot out of me, as you can see. But, but um, so I had, to, I had to really find a way to support that. And not only did I have to find a way to support it, I had to live in another country because the, I needed to be with people who spoke Spanish. And that's how I ended up in Mexico for half of the year since the 80s. Um, my Spanish is still terrible. But you know, you, you, you're led by what it is your gift needs, you know, the gift that you are preparing to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a way, and, and I hope this is helpful to some would-be writers, uh, it, it relieves you of anxiety in some ways about how it's going to be received. And that's why the criticism didn't really kill me, because I was completely aware that I was doing my job. You know, I, I could do, as somebody said, I could do no other. Who said that? Some, there's a famous person who said, oh, I, something like, I could do no other. Well, I could do no other. I had to do what I was doing. Uh, and whatever happened after that 
it was somebody else's business. It wasn't mm -hmm. mine. And actually, after each book or after each thing, I will say to the universe, you know, if that's it, I'm perfectly content. You know, I have my garden, I have my dog, I have my friends, I love to make fires. Not like big fires, but you know, <laughs> in, in my fireplace. Well, that was part of my other question. What do you just love to do to give yourself joy? So. I love to live in the country, where I live very far in the country, and I love making fires in my fireplace, and I love reading and listening to music. I love dancing. Mm -hmm. I love my friends. Uh, I love reading. Uh, I love travel, not so much anymore because it's getting harder and I can't stand the uh, security stuff because I see right through it. <clears throat> you know, if we're not, um, be getting more, if we're not becoming more and more aware <clears throat> that on some level we're being programmed to, you know, quickly take off our clothes and put them somewhere and, you know, I mean, I feel that every time I go through all that machinery. Um, but on a lighter note, you know, I love gardening. I have trees that I've planted and now they're very big and uh, that's very satisfying. Although recently in a big hurricane, I had planted two mango trees and the hurricane just took them. And that was very sad, but I wrote a poem about how eventually I looked out there at one of the stumps and there was a little bit of a twig coming up and uh, it made itself into a tree. And soon we'll have mangoes from just that. Mm. So the wonder of, of nature and the wonder of life, it is for everyone and, and that is part of what I would like people in deep struggle and deep sorrow struggle to realize that that's one of the medicines for us, nature. And of course, that's one of the reasons it's being destroyed because you know whoever is orchestrating this realize that nature is a support. And that's why they destroy indigenous villages and lands so that the people can no longer uh, have that support of nature and to fight back, you know to try to protect and save what is left. You said it is the triumphant heart, not the conquered heart, that forgives. With this book, are you still in the process of removing the arrow out of the heart? Well, let me, let me explain this mm -hmm. arrow in the mm -hmm. heart, because some people think that it's, a, it's, it's like, you know, it has some Cupid in there. It, it doesn't really, I mean, it could. I mean, I've had some terrible uh, breakups with people I loved and, you know, really suffered. But actually, um, this is a, a, a Buddhist thought, essentially. And I learned this from Pema Chodron, who's a, a Buddhist nun. Um, at some point, I was deeply, deeply suffering and felt that I could not get a particular arrow out. And through studying her work, I learned how to do a practice, which is basically uh, the short version of this. I mean, I, was, I practiced for a year, but you wouldn't have to practice for a year. But anyway, uh, you basically concentrate on, I hope there are meditators in here because that it would make more sense, but you concentrate on breathing in um, you know, all the, the, the arrow, you know, whatever it is, your grief over what they're doing to the elephants, which is a huge, huge sorrow. You know, the giraffes, you know, the Yemen, everything, uh, what has happened to, to our children. Uh, and you concentrate on really just filling every bit of yourself with this heavy, you know, sorrow. And you take it in for everyone. You, you're, you're bringing it into yourself. But then the other part of it is to breathe out for you and for everyone on the planet what you would rather have. Uh, and, you know, it can be just clean water, you know, no flints, you know, um, really wonderfully supported uh, schools and, and hospitals for everyone. Or it could be just a walk on the beach. But whatever it is, the absolute key is that it is for everyone. It has to be for everyone. It can't just be for you. And the, the, the way this is so revolutionary is, if, if you think about it, part of our deep problem 
is that we tend to think of just making things right for ourselves. And no wonder we are in this fix that we're in as a planet, because that will never work. You can't just make things right for you. You have to, you have to use every bit of your, your intelligence and your ingenuity and your thoughtfulness and your resources to spread whatever the goodness that you have to everyone. And you know, however you can do that, you know, it may be small, it may be piecemeal, it may be here, it may be there. But you have to really, um, you know, breathe out for the planet uh, the goodness that you that you want for yourself. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a beautifully um, stunning book, and I and one of the things that makes this book so beautiful is that it is a bilingual um, collection. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk about that. Why you made that choice? to do a dual translation. OK. Well, as I, I was saying earlier, I now live part of the time in Mexico. I, I, um, well, what happened was I was writing this novel, and I found a house in Puerto Vallarta and thought I was all set up. I got my typewriter out. This was when we used typewriters. Um, but then the dogs barked all night, because this was before they had a plan to call the dog population. So I ended up going down the coast and, um, you know, f finally, long story short, you know, found a house, bought a house, plugged in my typewriter and started working. So I've been there for all these years, but because I write so much in English, everything, um, my, my Spanish is, I can get around, but it's really poor. Meanwhile, I have really wonderful friends and they speak mostly Spanish. And so, I'm so mysterious to them in a way because they will say, well, you know, what are you doing? And I say, well, you know, I'm writing this novel and, and they kind of look at me like, well, in English? And I say, well, yeah. And I realize that I want them to know what I'm doing. I want them to understand what it is that I write. So I started a blog that is also bilingual um, just because part of what I feel, and this is a you know, small thing for me, but I feel like uh, for, for the planet, one of the things we can do is extend our understanding and our, our caring for other people beyond you know, where, where we normally stop. You know? And for me, making this bilingual, and then it was, um, it's translated, all my work on my blog is translated by a Cuban poet that I met in Havana in 85. I was there, they, they published all of my, my books and they always do really well. Um, and he and I work uh, using the, you know, the email. And it's just an amazing thing, because this started in 85, uh, you know, since we've known each other. And yet, you know, it's just our dedication to what we're doing that keeps us together. It's not seeing each other at all. Um, and it's, it's just magical, really. And he's become my brother. You know, we are brother and sister, and I feel this very deeply. Thank you. Well, yesterday, um, I think the, the writing world um, lost somebody very deeply. And I couldn't help but when I was working on um, getting together this morning, I pulled up the picture of you and Ntozaki Shange and Toni Morrison and June Jordan and several, several other women in, the, in that picture. And <clears throat> um, I wonder if you, um, I see that, that picture and I see sisterhood and I see women who are on the cusp, very close to the cusp of just changing everything in their own lives, changing literature, changing art. I see so many dreams swirling around on your faces and those bad leather jackets y'all wearing and the afros and just like everybody is just in a beautiful moment, it seemed. I wonder if you can talk about, um, if you remember that moment. Of course I do. If you could talk a little bit about her and 
it seemed y'all had a kinship. Mm -hmm. And just that space of what it meant to be in that space and watch your sisters go on and do brilliance. Uh, well, I love Zaki. Uh, I into Zaki Shange. Um, she was a powerful, sometimes very strange person, as we all are and were. Um, and I had published her in Ms. Magazine. I was an editor there, and she sent in a piece, and I loved it, and I published it. So that's part of the reason she's in that circle. I don't think she was living in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what happened was that June Jordan and I decided that we wanted to make it very clear that we would never accept um, the establishment ranking us. Never. That we would uh, always understand among ourselves that you know nobody was trying to get somewhere on anybody else's back. Wow. Uh, and and it was important to do that because uh, even to this day I notice I don't read Eastern stuff very much, but I can see that the the establishment will choose one black person or one person of color in every generation, and then they will try to clone that person right through the next several generations. And so you, you know, it's as if they have no imagination to actually say um, that a, a young black writer, male writer coming after James Baldwin is not like James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. He has to be like James Baldwin. And I, I don't, I think that's a problem. You know, it's, uh, it, it keeps us very uh, tightly um, contained. It means that they don't have to work to understand who else is doing what, you know. And, and you know us, we're always doing some more what, you know. <laughs> um, so we, we, you know, sisters, we, we were seven, seven of us, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were, I had a, a, a picture of Bessie Smith yeah. And I had taken it over to June's house because she had the biggest house. I had a time. I had gotten a divorce and I moved into two rooms. Um, so we had to, you know, have her house was big. So we were standing around this this wonderful picture of Bessie Smith, and we made this commitment that no matter what the establishment tried to do, in terms of ranking us and pretending that if they chose one, the other the others didn't exist, that we would ignore that that we knew who we were, and we would always respect each other's work. <laughs> In a way, it's about refusing to be chosen. And that's, for the young people in here, I really think it's worth thinking about that. Just refuse to be chosen, you know? Uh, because there is a price to pay for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see it all the time. We see so many people who, not just in literature, but in the movie business and everything, where they're, they're anointed in a certain way that actually leads to their, you know, their sometimes actual death. Uh, because suddenly the focus is all on them and it's as if they're the only. Um, and, and there's no reason for that. It limits us dreadfully. Thank you. I am actually going to ask a couple of um, questions from the audience that were submitted mm -hmm. online. Um, the first one is actually anonymous. What is a key piece of advice you would give a young woman and gender non-conforming people of color in the creative world? Young meaning folks who are new to developing their work and voice, as well as those who are young in age? Well, there's only one thing I can tell you, and that is be true to whoever you are. It's up to other people whether they can accept you, and you, can, you have to accept that, you know? I mean, if they don't, can't, will not, what can you do? You persist. Mm -hmm. And actually, the best teacher there would be nature. You know, nature's full of everything. And once you get really clear about that, that, you know, you can, nature produces trans and, and untrans and 
tall trans and short trans and cis and no cis. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, just be more like nature, more accepting of your right to be how you are and to express yourself. I always think of myself as, um, you know, a tree basically producing what it is that I produce. Um, people complain, uh, they used to anyway, um, you know, why did you do this, why don't you do that? And I can only say that, would you say that to a peach tree? <laughs> I gotta use that one. <laughs> I gotta, I'm using that one. If you don't mind, I wanna use that. Jane Mueller Anagri asks, what inspired you to write The Color Purple? Uh, I lived with my grandparents when I was eight years old, and I had been wounded, and I was in very dire straits and sad, and I was missing my parents. And However, they were wonderful to me. Uh, my, my grandfather, um, you know, this is such an aside, but you might find it amusing. Um, especially if you know anything about watermelons. My grandfather used to keep his watermelons under the bed because that was the coolest spot. Now, isn't that wonderful? I mean, aren't you glad you know that now? I mean, I, I learned so many incredible things, and, and also that you, 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 you grow your peanuts, and you, you know, you, well, I ate as many as I could, but then you save your seed peanuts in the cabinet way up high, so that, you know, little Alice will not find them and eat them, which I did. Um, and, and he and my grandmother never, you know, scolded me or anything. They were just incredibly loving. Now, the, 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 the thing that was so amazing later on was to realize that they had been completely different people when they were younger. That he was a demon, especially. Uh, and, and yet, you know, he loved me, and I loved him, and we were just inseparable. We were very, we were very t much like twin spirits. We could sit on the porch for hours. Uh, the highway was not far from the porch, and we'd see cars going by, and he would choose a color, and I would choose a color. And, you know, we would spend long, long hours just, you know, meditating and looking at the cars and choosing this and that. So, I wasn't, you know, happy that even though I was a writer, I had not taken the time to spend more time with them as young people. And luckily, as a novelist, you can actually do that, I mean, in a way. So I decided I would write about them. I would write about my grandparents. Uh, Rachel was my step-grandmother, but a very loving woman. Uh, and and the, what I was hoping that some of my readers would actually read and, and understand is that the way that we are shaped as young people um, often changes. We change as we go into old age. And he, he had certainly done that. And she too, to some extent, although not as much you know, as Celie. But you know, as old people, when I knew them, they were not like they were when they were teenagers. I mean, he, but for instance, he had stopped drinking. Uh, he'd also stopped uh, making moonshine. And both of those things are important because part of his derangement came because he was an alcoholic. So I, I was really just totally, um, you know, loving them and wanting very much for other people reading the book to understand how we change, you know, how we, we go through these periods in our lives when we're all kinds of ways. But we can also develop and we can grow and we can be friends with people that we thought we would never be friends with, you know. And they, my grandparents did become friends with each other. You know, they got to be really old. He died at 89. And, you know, his Miss Rachel, you know, she was there and they, they were just friends at the end. But their beginning had been terrible. Um. 
At this point in time, this is <clears throat> from Lillian, in the current political and cultural climate of our country, what do you think is the most important thing writers should be doing? Well, it would depend on the writer. And I was asked this more or less the same question recently, and I said, I think it's time for less writing and more dancing. <laughs> you know, in other words, get in touch with your spirit. You know, it, it, writing is wonderful, but without the spirit that goes into it, and that, again, comes out of silence. It comes out of deep stillness. Without that, all the writing, um, you know, you can do a lot of it, but it may not go anywhere. And that's why you see there is so much writing, and often it doesn't move you anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I sometimes, um, I love aud audible, you know, uh, audio novels, uh, listening to novels, and I'm often stunned with how many just lack life. They, they are not alive. And so these are people who are just writing and writing and writing and writing, but to what you know, purpose? Because we're not encouraged to develop, we're not encouraged to grow, you know. We're not encouraged to be more fearless uh, and more risk-taking. So just to write uh, is, is not the first thing. The first thing is to nurture the spirit and to be in touch with what you really are and what your mission is in this incarnation. Mm -hmm. are you, who are you reading now that you are excited about? Huh? Are you, who are you reading now that you are excited about? Is there writers? Well, actually, I'm rereading Another Country uh, by Baldwin, and uh, I'm, I'm listening to it on audio. And last night, I was so happy to realize that the person reading it that I thought was dreadful at the beginning has somehow inc improved. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating book. And, and I was thinking, um, this book, if it were made into a movie, uh, and if it had been made into a movie when it was written, you know, we would be much farther along in every way you could think, really. I mean, it is incredible. And I'm so happy because I, I really love Baldwin. I think he was just extraordinarily brave and, you know, thoughtful and determined and, you know, a real, a real human being, you know, the kind yeah. that I think of a real peach tree. A real peach tree. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to end with this last question from Alexandra. What are you excited about right now in your life? Going home. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I think, you know, I wish that for everyone. You know, home is, 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 home is special. Uh, and when you see all the people who are being displaced now, I mean, my, the arrow in the collective heart, part of it, is that so many people and beings, not just people, but, you know, beings are losing their, their homes. Um, you know, these, these uh, floods and tornadoes and things that are just eating away the coasts where people live and, and there's just nothing left. And then in places like, you know, our cities, you know, people are, are out on the street. Um, so home is really precious. And again, it's about understanding that what we wish for ourselves, you know, which is a home that is safe, that is, that is warm, comfortable, that is what we wish for and we insist on having for everyone. We must never, ever give up, you know, that, that belief that everyone should be housed and fed and taken care of. We should never, ever desert that. Alice Walker, thank you for the bottom of my heart, oh. for being a reminder of so many things we need right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you.